The title of this video looks innocuous, but the motivation is to evaluate a very serious claim of fraud made in March 2022 about an influential published medical study. I'll leave the details of the particular study until the end, and instead present a simpler general hypothetical example that captures all the key features of the real case and explains step by step how basic statistics enables us to evaluate the claim of fraud. Imagine we have a group of 50 randomly selected people. These might be the patients in a medical trial who are treated with a particular drug. Now for each of a number of attributes, for example, male, under 30, smoker, etc., we record the number of people in the group who have that attribute. Now suppose we have another group of 50 people, let's suppose it's a control group, claimed to be randomly selected, but where we find these numbers. Now these pairings are pretty closely matched but are the pairings too closely matched for this to happen by chance? Intuitively, if the groups were genuinely random, we'd expect the proportion of each attribute to be similar to the relevant population proportion with that attribute. And we can estimate the relevant population proportion by the proportion overall with the attribute in these groups. For example, 51 out of the 100, that's 50.5%, of the people overall in the groups are males, so we can use that as an estimate for the overall relevant male population. And we'd expect to get, therefore, on average 25 or 26 in each group. In fact, there's actually more than an 87% chance that the number would be between 20 and 30. For the rarer attributes, like kidney failure, it would be even more likely that the numbers would be similar. Assuming a 0.5% population proportion, there's a greater than 97% chance that you'd see 0 or 1 in a group of 50. We also have to consider inevitable correlations arriving from dependencies between attributes. For example, people with cancer are almost certain to have had chemotherapy. So if you've got a similar pairing here, you'd see the same similar pairing here. The error in assuming that the pairings are too similar arises from the assumption that for each attribute, the number of people with the attribute is genuinely random. If this were the case, then indeed things would be different and our conclusions would change. So let's compare the situations. Imagine, for example, if each of the two groups of n people were given a number of tokens which could be any number, all equally likely, between 0 and n. Then if n is equal to 10, suppose three people in group 1 get a token and six people in group 2 get a token. Then we write this as the pairing 3-6. There are 11 times 11 possible equally likely pairings and in general this number would be n plus 1 squared. And these are those 121 in this case, different possible pairings, all of which are considered equally likely. Now what we're interested in is the probability that a pairing would be very similar. Well we can create a corresponding table showing the difference between the pairings. For example, on the diagonal, we find all the cases where the difference is 0. So 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. They've all got a difference of 0 in the pairings. There are 11, i.e. n plus 1 of these. Now adjacent to the diagonal, on both sides, we have those with a difference of 1. And there are 10, i.e. n of these, on each side. So that's 2 times n in total. And then adjacent to those, we have those with the difference 2. And there are 9, i.e. n minus 1 of these on each side. So that's 2 times n minus 1 in total with a difference of 2. And adjacent to those, we have those with a difference of 3, etc. And eventually we get to those with a difference of 9. There's 2 here and 2 here. So that's 4 in total. And just 2, 1 here and 1 here, with a difference of 10. And here's the full list with the corresponding expression for the general term. And note that these sum to 121 as they must since there are 121 pairs in total. So in general, for any number r between 0 and n, the number of pairs with difference r is this formula, 2 times n minus r plus 1. That means if any number between 1 and 10 is equally likely, i.e. each of the pairings is equally likely, then the probability of getting a pair with a difference r is this formula, 2 times n minus r plus 1, that's the number of pairings with a difference of r, divided by the number of pairings, which is 121, or n plus 1 squared. So now, 
let's consider this question. How likely is it to observe a pairing whose difference is at most one? Well, the answer here is that the probability that we get a difference of zero plus the probability that we get a difference of one, which is 0.174. Next question, how likely is it to observe a pairing whose difference is at most two? Well, it's the probability we get a difference of zero plus the probability we get a difference of one plus the probability we get a difference of two, and that turns out to be 0 0.405. And we can carry on and calculate for any r the probability of observing a pairing whose difference is at most r. Now, obviously, we can generalise this to any number. So suppose n is equal to 50, then we have a table of 51 squared pairings, that's 2,601. Then we get this corresponding difference table. We get the same general formula in here. And again, these sum to 2,601. And so again, we can use the general formula to calculate, for example, how likely it is to observe a pairing whose difference is at most one. In this case, where well, we've got n equal to 50. Well, it's much lower now, and that's 0 0.058. So it's just over 6%. And how likely is it to observe a pairing whose difference is at most two? Well, again, using that same formula, that's just under 10%. So going back to our set of attributes for groups of 50 people, we can now calculate the problem of observing pairings with these particular differences, or smaller, under the different assumptions. Now, under the original assumption, where the proportion with the attribute is assumed to be the population rate, we can compute these probabilities using the binomial theorem. You can look at my video on binomial theorem to find out more about that. And these are the probabilities. Under the second assumption, that the number with each attribute is a random number between 0 and 50, with each equally likely, we get these probabilities based on the formula I just explained from first principles. Now, I've covered those probabilities below 15%, where the darker the colour, the less likely it would be to have seen this particular pairing by chance. So under the first assumption, there's nothing really suspicious in the similarities of the pairings. I mean, the probability of observing a difference as small or lower than this is actually quite high in most cases. Only one attribute, that's the smoker, has a pairing where the probability of observing this difference or less is below 23%. And even this is almost 10%. But under assumption two, there's a suspiciously low probability of observing as small a difference or lower for most of the pairings. Hence, under assumption two, it is reasonable to suspect that something's going on that isn't purely random here. But the problem is that assumption two is not a reasonable assumption to make for these kinds of personal attributes. But there's another assumption we can make about the numbers with a given attribute that might be even more realistic given the circumstances of a limited number of trial patients. We saw that 4 out of the 50 people in group 1 had COPD and 3 out of the 50 in group 2 had COPD. So we know that there were 7 in total with that attribute. So we can ask the following question. Given that there were 7 people in total with the attribute, What's the probability exactly four would be found in group one and three would be found in group two? That's this formula. Where this expression, which is called NCR, is a number of combinations of size R from N, which is equal to this formula. And applying this formula gives us this result. But by the same formula, there's also a 0.282 probability of getting exactly 3 in group 1 and 4 in group 2. So the probability of getting a difference of 1 is the sum of those two probabilities, which is 0.564. Now there's no other way to get a difference of 1, as the only other possible pairings are 5, 2, 2, 5, 6, 1, 1, 6, 7, 0, and 0, 7. So as no possible pairing has a difference of 0, the probability of getting the difference or lower than what was observed, namely 1, is just 0.564. And we can use the following general formula for the probability of getting exactly x out of 50 in group 1 and y out of 50 in group 2, given a total of x plus y. That's called the hypergeometric distribution.
And now we can use that formula to calculate the probability of getting an observed difference or less in the pairings by chance under the assumption that we've just been making. That the numbers with the attribute in each group can be any numbers which sum to the total number observed overall with the attribute. Now note how these probabilities are even higher than under assumption 1 and completely different to the all numbers are equally likely assumption 2 that would erroneously lead to suspicion of fraud. Now why is this important? Because in March 2022, a claim was made that there must have been fraud in a 2017 study by Marik et al. of vitamin C for treating sepsis patients. In this study, there were 47 patients in each of the treatment and control groups, and these were the pairings for the relevant set of attributes. The claim was that these pairings were so similarly matched that it couldn't have happened by chance, it must have been fraud. But the basis for this claim used a statistic called the p-value from Fisher exact test, which is based on the hypergeometric assumption. And that p-value statistic is defined as the probability of observing at least as big a difference as the one actually observed. And the claim was that these should average 0.5 by chance. And so the fact that there are many values of 1 and well above 0.5 is an indication of fraud, that there must have been a deliberate attempt to make the groups similar. But this claim that the values of one and close to it means that the pairings are unusually unlikely is only true under the incorrect assumption too, whereby the probability of a, of a particular pairing assumes any number between 0 and 47 is equally likely. Indeed, with that incorrect assumption, we get these very low probabilities of observing this or lower difference. So under that assumption too, these pairings would genuinely be suspicious. It's highly unlikely you would have got all of those very low values by chance. But under the realistic assumption 3, almost none of the probabilities are unlikely. The most unlikely ones are here, but probably observing that difference, they couldn't be smaller in these cases, are 16% and 18% respectively under the, the realistic assumption 3. And so there's no evidence of fraud in these observations with that more realistic assumption. And of course, all of this ignores the inevitable dependencies and correlations between the attributes, which if factored in, would make these probabilities even more likely.